that will be a free event. We just want to pack this place out with people from all over the community to come and be educated and inspired and see how they can get involved in some way of turning things around in our education system. We are also partnering with Faith and Freedom to have a day conference on October 29th. That will be a ticketed event because of the different speakers that they are bringing in. So we will start having an Eventbrite sign up that's also available for that. So please keep those two dates free and start talking to your friends about being part of that. All right, Renee, come on up. Praise the Lord, saints. Amen. It's that time in the service where we give joyfully unto the Lord and honor him with our tithes and our offering. You know, Abraham was the first person in the Bible that, that's mentioned that paid his tithes. And he paid his tithes to Melchizedek, and he gave 10%. And the reason why we give 10% because that's what God institution, instituted, and that's what he requires. And we know today that Jesus is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So today we want to encourage you to give your tithes and your offering unto the Lord. Um, if you're watching us online, you can give by hitting the donate button. You can use our AIC app. You can text to give or, any, or you can use any of the means on the screen behind me. Let's look unto the Lord. Father God, we come before you this morning just thanking you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for fresh wind and fresh fire. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for the church of God. Father God, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus changes lives, Lord God. And Father God, we just pray, Lord God, that as we leave this place, Lord God, but never from your presence, Lord. Father God, that the winds of God would continue to blow, Lord God, in our homes, in our community, across the city, oh God, in the nation, Lord God. Father God, we pray, Lord God, that there will be provision for every good work, Lord God. That your grace would abound towards us, Lord God. Father God, that we would come behind in no gift, Lord. But we would be the church that you have called us to be in the last days, Lord God. Father God, the dark of the night, Lord God, we know the bright of the light. And the gospel, Lord God, is shining bright right now in America, Lord God. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for the wailing women, Lord God. Father God, we thank you for the men and women in this nation that are standing in the gap, that are building up the wall, Lord God. Father God, and we are on the wall and we're doing a good work and we're not coming down, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you are for us. You are with us, Lord God. Father God, and we just pray for our families that they will be blessed. We pray for the prodigals to return to you. And Lord God, we pray that America will be saved, Lord God. That they would know you as Lord and Savior once again, oh God. That we will return to our Judeo-Christian principles, Lord God. For your word says, return to me and I will return to you, Lord God. And so, God, we pray for an awakening, Lord God. We pray for revival, Lord God. And Lord, once again, we ask, let it begin with us, Lord God. Let it begin in our homes, Lord. Let it begin in our communities. Let it begin in our cities. And let it begin in our nation, Lord God. Let it start with us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're watching the service online, we encourage you to, to share it on, sa on Facebook, save book. <laughs> Lord, save Facebook. Amen. <laughs> so share it on Facebook as well as on YouTube. And at this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Peter to come. Praise God. Our honorable apostle, Peter Wins. Thank you. I'm not preaching today. But I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Dr. Raul Molina, come on up, please. Most of you will know Dr. Molina. He is a dentist, and he is an apostle. He is serving as a pastor, uh, and he travels the world, and he's my friend. And uh, we've been walking together in the ministry for about 20 years now. And he's got a great Holy Spirit family. Uh, starting with his parents, and uh, they came from Cuba and uh, have planted a flag for Christ in the United States, and from there to the nations. Will you please give him a hand as he ministers? Hallelujah. You may be seated. Today I have a little bit of laryngitis, 
So I ask that you be patient with me. I'm going to try to get this message out to you this morning. But I will put on my monotone Derek Prince teaching voice today. But the Word of God is like a seed, amen? If you're able to, to let it into your heart and it finds good soil, it will spring forth and bring fruit for the kingdom of God. So it's a joy to be here this morning uh, with my good friend also from Cuba, Pastor Ruby Ajo. Ruby, say hello. Amen, amen. Uh, Ruby oversees uh, around 20-something churches in the uh, eastern part of the island of Cuba. He is here in the United States for a few more weeks, and then he returns to the work of God. Uh, so keep him in your prayers. The church in Cuba is going through a very hard time, a lot of persecution, a lot of stress. Uh, recently, uh, two days ago, lightning hit uh, one of the biggest um, reservoirs of oil that they use over there for uh, fuel. Uh, I think it was diesel or gasoline, and the whole thing exploded. And, and they're in a crisis now. Uh, then the tank next to it exploded because of the fire. Uh, many people have died, and it's very near an ammonium uh, tank. And if that catches fire and explodes, there's toxic fumes that they say potentially can kill thousands of people. That's going on right now. They're asking for international help, and uh, we're praying for that situation in Cuba. Keep them in your prayers. Amen. Uh, today I want to talk about the physiology of stress, the physiology of stress. How many here understand what stress is? How many have been close up with a little bit of stress, especially over the last two years? And uh, in, in our church in Miami, they get the benefit of having a, a pastor who's also a, a doctor. Uh, I'm uh, a scientist, and so I'm able to put together uh, scripture with science in a way that benefits the people of God. And the understanding comes through revelation of the Holy Spirit. So we can, we don't want to lecture people, uh, but we want to give people the understanding that allows them to live their life in a, in, in a better way for God, but it will also impact their life and their health. And we want to talk about that today, but turn with me first to John chapter 16 and verse 33. Here Jesus says in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we thank you and we ask that you would open our spiritual ears, open our spiritual hearts, that we might receive the seed of your word and then it might find good soil in our hearts and produce fruit for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, and we all say, amen, amen. So here Jesus is giving us something that's a, a, a principle in the world, and as long as we're in the world, we know that we have to expect that we will address and confront and deal with something he called tribulation. Now, we've been told by doctors and, and people that stress makes you sick. Uh, and, and Christians have been told that our troubles began when Adam sinned and, and they fell from the presence of God. But as I've read the scriptures, I, I look at it and I see that even before the fall of man, even before Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the forbidden fruit, God had given Adam four big sources of trouble that were very stressful. First, he gave him a job. He gave him work to do. How many find that worse can, work can be stressful, amen? Uh, I don't know recently, but I know that traditionally dentists, I'm a dentist, have the highest suicide rate of all the professions. So I might not be out there digging ditches, but I am in a high-risk job, and during the pandemic, we were, you know, high-risk very high risk. We were number one in the pandemic for exposure to the COVID virus. But in general, our jobs, our sources, can be sources of stress. God also told Adam to get married. How many know that marriage can be a source of stress? <laughs> Dr. Kenneth Cooper, if, you're, if you ever heard of him, a researcher, he says that out of all the stresses in, in life, 
the t- out of the top four stressors in life, three of them are related to our relationship, our marriage. The third thing was, God told Adam to have a lot of kids. I have seven. I don't know how many you have. But how many think kids can be a, a, a source of stress and trouble? Amen? Sometimes. And then, to make it worse, he told Adam he had to keep a vegetarian diet. Can you imagine? No more steak, no more barbecue. I mean, I could not do that transition, but God told Adam he could only eat veggies. So those, these were tremendous sources of stress. So I don't think stress started when man sinned. I think God designed the world to be a place where we have to learn how to live with stress, maybe even... Maybe even stress has a purpose. We don't know. Let's read. But many Christians don't want to suffer. They don't want to pay the price to do the will of God. They want to go through the Christian life. They want to go through their spiritual journey with as little stress, as little trouble as possible. Um, Friday night, we were watching uh, a movie. Joy put on a movie about, the, I think it was called 13 Lives or something. 13 Boys. In Taiwan, the 13 kids that got trapped in a cave, and then the monsoon came, the waters rose, and they could not get out of the cave, and they had to go underwater through these complicated cave patterns to rescue the kids, but it took many hours diving in darkness, complete darkness, through a cave system to get to the boys, and then they had to bring them back out. These are young boys, and they knew these boys would panic if they had to go out that way. And so they had to give them general anesthesia. So they gave them general anesthesia, put them to sleep, put an oxygen mask on them, wrapped them up, and then went one by one through that whole long journey through the caves and the rocks and the tight spaces until one by one that got them all out of the cave system. And I said, that's a good sermon idea. How many Christians will love for the Lord to just come and give you general anesthesia And when we wake up, we're on the other side, you know? What happened? I don't care. I got through. Amen. I made it. So we have to start thinking that maybe God doesn't want that for us, that there is a purpose for the stress. There's a reason why Jesus said, you're going to have tribulation in the world. I will give you peace, but you're going to have tribulation. I'm going to show you how to overcome because I overcame, but you're going to have to overcome. Amen? You're going to have to overcome. No general anesthesia to ease the pain. So we tend to have turned stress into an enemy. But today I want to change your mind about stress. And the reason is because we need God's people to be brave and bold. We need God's people to learn how to take the bull by the horns. We need to learn how to, how to run toward the giants and defeat them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and not be cowards. Cowards don't have a very prominent role to play in God's eternal kingdom. But we also need to show the world how to live life to its fullest and how to not live in fear. So in the process, I believe that God allows us to learn how to live life to our fullest potential as he designed it to be. So stress has a purpose. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have life in abundance. That's a life that's increasing. That's not a health that's deteriorating. That's not a a cowardice and a fear that grows bigger with your problems. Jesus says, I came that you would have life and a life that's growing, that's abounding, that's increasing. So many Christians are frustrated or let down because of the difficulties in the Christian life. And some give up and start, stop going to church, stop living by faith. The reason is they were sold what I call a cheap gospel, a gospel of grace only, a gospel of deception because it was not the gospel of the kingdom. So in the past, we try to convince people by faith to give themselves to do the whole will of God. And this was our burden as as leaders, as speakers and and preachers. Or we would pray that they would take a step of faith 
and learn how to live for God, or we would encourage people to pray until God touched their life and gave them a spiritual revelation or something. And we, we know testimonies. I, I had a, a man and his wife coming to church for many years, and he was on fire for God. God had touched him, and the wife would come to church just to keep him company, but she was in la-la land the whole time she was in the meeting. I mean, he was there crying, worshiping God, and she was like looking off into the distance, wondering, you know, how long the service was going to be today, how soon she could get home and do whatever she had to do at home. She was like out of it. She had not been touched by God. But after about two years, something happened. That's how the Holy Spirit works. And God touched her, and she had a spiritual awakening, and she was never the same. She started having Bible studies in her house. She had a, a, a hair salon. She was the owner of a hair salon, so she opened it up on Tuesday nights, and she would have Bible studies in her hair salon for the other hairstylists that worked there. And it was revolutionary, but it was a touch of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Sometimes it, you can't beat somebody over the head with the Bible. You just have to pray for them and wait for the Holy Spirit to do something supernatural. And then it's real. It's genuine. Amen? So, but when we look at the advances in medicine and science and how knowledge has increased, we understand a lot more today about the consequences physiologically in our body about how we live our lives, the way that we live our lives and how that reflects in our health. So now we have medical and scientific evidence that affirms that God's purpose is the best possible choice for living on this planet. And it's backed up by science. So one study that I want to quote, they took 30,000 adults, 30,000, it's not a little group, in the United States, and they studied them for eight years. And they found that people who went through a lot of stress had a 43% increased risk of dying when you went through a lot of stress. Because stress really does increase the risk of everything negative, from the common cold to cardiovascular disease. But the, negatives of stress, the, the negative effects of stress come because your body responds to the stress by releasing certain hormones, certain neurotransmitters, certain chemicals in your body that cause negative results, that some of them are glucagon, epinephrine, also called adrenaline, norepinephrine, cortisol. Those are the negative corporate or bodily responses to stress in your life. And those chemicals are very bad and they can kill you and they increase your, your risk of death. But on the other hand, if you experience a lot of stress, but you love God, how many love God? And you're living according to his purpose. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But it's the key. Because everybody loves God. But if you love God and you're living according to his purpose, and you believe what the Bible says about tribulation and trouble, then you no longer see problems and tribulations and stress as something harmful if, if that's your mindset, then the study shows that you're no more likely to die. In fact, you will have the lowest risk of dying than anybody else in that study. In spite of having maybe the same or more stress. Even compared to people who have very little stress in their life. So we got to ask the question. Can loving God and living according to his purpose make you healthier? So according to the Bible, and now according to science, the answer is definitely. So when you begin to live according to Romans 8.28, turn there with me today because I, this is, I guess, the foundational verse that brings all the concepts together spiritually. In Romans 8, 28, when you begin living to this, you can actually change how your body responds to stress. In Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that God causes all things to work for, together for the good of those who love God 
and those who are called according to his purpose. This is not, there's a silver lining in every cloud. That's not what it is. This is not a cliche. This is a principle for life, for health, for godliness, and for abundance in your life. It's not a principle to eliminate stress. It's a, it's a principle for you to evaluate stress and change your response and your perception of your problems. Because a lot of people today are drowning because of their problems. They're in chaos because of their troubles. And I believe the chaos and the drowning is not the problem. The problem is how they perceive and respond to stress and problems in their life. And these are just symptoms that we're looking at. So we need to retrain our mind. We need to start to rethink how we respond to stress and, and how our body reacts to difficulties and understand that sometimes these are spiritual signals from God. When our heart starts racing fast, when our breathing increases and we're hyperventilating, it's God's way of sending more oxygen to our organs, to our brain. But it also means you better get on your knees and you better start praying about that. We're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, but if we get sick and we're breathing hard, we get tachycardia, we run to the doctor. Get on your knees and start praying. God is sending you some signals. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is why we pray. Because it protects our mind from releasing the negative neurotransmitters. It protects our heart and our cardiovascular system. It changes your response to stress. You're not going to suffer the ill effects that the world suffers because they don't live the life of faith that you live. So we got to pray. If you go to the doctor, it's okay. Go to the doctor. But don't just go to the doctor. Pray and go to the doctor. Pray while you're waiting for the doctor. Amen? Let me tell you something that, that releases amounts of beneficial chemicals in your blood. Two things. Number one, when you proclaim and declare your thankfulness to God. How many know Thanksgiving is awesome? When you're thankful, it's awesome. But does it really affect your brain at a biological level? Yes, it does. Gratitude boosts the levels of something called dopamine in your body. Gratitude. So trying to think of things to be thankful to God for forces you to, forces you to focus on the positive things of your life. So even the simple act of thinking about it and looking for something to be thankful to God for it releases dopamine and something else called serotonin. So, you know, sometimes life is tough and, and you get hit hard with certain problems that were, you know, they hit you right in the gut and it feels like you don't have anything to be grateful to God for. But guess what? It doesn't matter. All you have to do is find a reason to be thankful for the stress or the problems. And it's not so much whether or not you find a reason. The act of searching for something to be thankful for is what begins to change the release of these neurotransmitters in your blood. Just searching, just the act of looking for something changes your physiology. You might say, Everything, everything's so bad in my life, I have very little to be thankful I have nothing to be thankful for. It doesn't matter. Keep looking. Just the act of searching changes your physiology. But remember, thanksgiving is also a characteristic of high emotional intelligence. So research shows that the more you are thankful to God, the easier it becomes to find things to be grateful for. The more thankful you are to God, all of a sudden you will see more things to be thankful for. That's the first thing. The second thing is, how do you apply physiology of faith to your relationships? 
Being thankful to God doesn't just make your brain happy. It can also create a positive feedback loop in our relationships. So when we express gratitude, we should also express it to the people in our life. And, and you're not specifically thanking them, but you're thanking God for them. You're thanking God for putting them in your life. In other words, being grateful for the people in your life releases chemicals in your brain that makes you love them more. That makes you easier to live with, makes it easier to live with them and serve them. So look around your life. Who's irritating you? Who knows how to push your buttons, right? Are you sleeping with the enemy? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but as you begin to thank God for them, you will be able to love them more. As you begin to love them more, you will be able to thank God more for them. And God will begin to do things that you could never do in that relationship because you've learned the physiology of faith. So, but the opposite is true, listen to me. The more you look down on somebody or despise them and you look only at the negative in their life, you're gonna find it harder to love them. They will no longer help release the chemicals in your brain like they did when you were looking at the positive things in their lives and thanking God for them. One guy, uh, researchers, they developed a system where they could predict with almost 99% accuracy what couples were gonna get divorced. And what they did was they videotaped them and uh, they were just talking in the videotape, asking them silly questions, nothing important in the videotape. Then later the researchers who weren't in the interview reviewed the videotapes and they affirmed with 99% accuracy which couples were gonna get divorced or not based on whether or not one showed a, a, an attitude of despisement toward the other or looked down on the other. If they, if they noted that on the video, they knew that that relationship was gonna go from bad to worse, it was gonna end up in divorce. So remember, number one, gratitude toward God for his blessings in your life releases dopamine. When we're grateful for the people that God has placed in our life, it releases serotonin. These are all great chemicals that make you healthier. These, the, the, not the Bible science says that these neurotransmitters give you a sense of, listen, this is science. I love it when science has to resort to using biblical terms. Isn't that great? Because there's no other way to define the, the, the facts and the evidence that they're discovering. Science says that these neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin, make the patients or the people feel a sense of joy, happiness, and peace. That's tremendous. All this just for being grateful. Now, you want to sleep better tonight? People that express, and I want to put the emphasis on express, people that express thankfulness to God regularly is not just, oh, I'm grateful to God in here. You know, we all walk around, oh, I'm so thankful to God. No, expressing it. How do we express thankfulness to God? When we're praising and worshiping God. When we're driving in the car, throwing some praise and worship music. When you're just praying, you have to express it. It's not just a fuzzy feeling. People that express thankfulness to God regularly, sleep better, feel more rested, and have less chronic pain. Faith is a powerful medicine but it's so easy to just run to the doctor and take a pill. Express gratitude to God and to others. Express, express it, say it. Don't just feel it, say it. I am thankful to God for you. Now, in a typical stress response, your heart rate goes up, your blood vessels constrict, so this is why chronic stress is associated with increased cardiovascular disease. It's not healthy to be in that state all the time. But when you love God 
and you're living according to his purpose, believing in God, believing that God is in control of your life, but yet you suffer the same amount of stress as somebody else, your heart rate still goes up, but now your blood vessels, instead of constricting, they begin to relax and dilate, just like it does in moments when you feel joy or courage. And there's one more benefit of stress in your life. The most, the most surprising effect of this type of stress response is that it makes you want to go to church. <laughs> it's true. It's true. This is a doctor up here, right? I'm not just a pastor. So you can say the doctor told me, all right? Now, to understand how stress affects people who are living by faith and trusting in God, we need to talk about another chemical. It's called oxytocin. Oxytocin is also called the cuddle hormone because it's released when you hug someone. But it also makes you crave social contacts with family in church. It, makes you, it gives you a strong desire to strengthen close relationships. It gives you a desire for close physical contact and it makes you more willing to help and support people in your life. So when you're stressed, listen to me, when you're stressed and you're living in God's purpose, your body releases oxytocin so that you can go to the body of Christ and seek counsel and seek support and seek help. It's like a yearning. You don't know what it is, but you know you want to go to church. And you want to share what you're going through with others. But it also makes you more sensitive to people that are going through problems and struggles so that you can be more helpful to them. But oxytocin is a powerful protector of the cardiovascular system. It makes your heart healthier. Tell the person next to your church makes me healthy. Tell them. I've got a friend of mine, he's an international evangelist, international. The guy's, he's filled stadiums with 50, 60,000 people. And, and whenever he's coming through Miami, I invite him to come and we fellowship. And occasionally he'll come to church and he'll share. And his name is Enrique, he's from uh, Guatemala. And, and, and he's a successful businessman who just dedicated himself to, uh, to uh, doing the will of God and evangelizing and praying for others. Spirit-filled man. And when Enrique comes to church, I have to tell him, Enrique, when you're going to preach in my church, you don't have to use the Bible necessarily, but at least walk up to the pulpit with the Bible. <laughs> and then just put it aside and then preach so that people think, okay, well, yeah, he's a pastor. You know, he knows what he's doing. But he understands the physiology of faith. And many times when people come for prayer, instead of prophesying, instead of saying, thus saith the Lord, he just looks at them and the Holy Spirit tells them, Hug that person. And he hugs them. And that person is healed. They're delivered. The anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon their life because they've been suppressed. They've been a slave, a prisoner of stress and trouble in their life. And they just needed, not prayer, they needed a hug. And the healing power was already within them, but they needed somebody with the faith to release it in them with a hug. So oxytocin acts on your body to protect your cardiovascular system from the negative effects of stress. In other words, oxytocin be becomes like a, a protectant, a lubricant in your life, so that stress slides off. Amen? If you see somebody that's all wired up and neurotic, give him a hug. <laughs> give him, for God's, don't pray for them. Definitely don't yell at them. Don't punch them in the nose. I know sometimes we think that's, a, that's our solution. That's not what they need. They need some spiritual lubrication. God needs to release oxytocin in them so that they're protected against the negative effects of stress. It's a natural, listen to this, it's a natural anti-inflammatory. This is science. But don't give him a gay hug. Give him a Christian hug. Ah. Wow. 
Because if you love God and you're living according to his purpose, these things will work in the right way. Without God, without living in God's purposes, you can get all the love you want. It's going to kill you sooner. It's the wrong kind of love. It's a natural anti-inflammatory. It helps your blood vessels stay relaxed. Helps your heart regenerate and heal from stress-induced damage. We can reverse cardiovascular disease. Now, science is still at the place that they think they can do it only with diet. I'm sorry. It's not just diet. You got to love God. And you have to be living in God's purpose. Then we can truly reverse cardiovascular disease. So all, all of these physical benefits of oxytocin are enhanced. They're boosted when we go to church and we fellowship with one another. And we serve one another. It has a potentiating effect on oxytocin. So then your body releases more of this hormone. And your stress responses become healthier. And you recover faster from any stress in your life. So connecting with one another in Christ makes us healthier. How many say amen? amen. I'm glad you came to church today. It don't work watching live streaming online. I want to tell those who are watching today, I'm sorry I can't hug you where you're at. But if you came here, we can boost your oxytocin. <laughs> That's why the devil has interfered with the fellowshipping of the saints. It's not the same. You can stay home and get a lot of benefits. You can get wisdom, knowledge, understanding. But there's so many positive things that you can get only when you get your butt out of bed and you come to the house of God. To the person next to you, he's talking to you. <laughs> so how you deal, how you deal with stress and suffering matters. First, the, First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 16 and 18, it says, Rejoice always, praying without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen? We, we want to rebuke the devil. No. Give thanks in all circumstances. For every problem, whether it was brought to you by God or brought to you by the devil. Reap the benefits of the devil's problems. When the devil throws a curveball at you, say, oh, great, this is going to make me healthier. When somebody betrays you, backstabs you, says something negative to you, say, hallelujah. I'm going to experience an abundance of life because of this. Because that's God's design. When you know that God is with you and that he will not allow you to go through anything greater than you can handle, you will begin to see stress differently in your life and begin to be thankful in all things. Stress will make you healthier and stronger and you will live longer. So accept, accept stress. Accepts suffering instead of just running away or trying to avoid it. If you have no stress, zero stress, you're not going to get any of the benefits. You, you, can, you don't need oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, all the healthy stuff that's good for you, that makes your system stronger and better. You're not going to get none of that. If your life is good, you're going to die. Matata. So I have some ideas for you because there's always people like that in church. I don't know why God blesses me so much. I ain't got no stress in my life. 
Why are people so bothered? I'm always praying for people to have stress, and I, I got no stress. Listen, let me save your life. Let me, let me give you some, some encouragement today. You might not die young because you have no stress and no problems, but you're not becoming stronger. You're not becoming better. You're not becoming everything that God wants you to be without stress in your life. Because God designed a stressful world and put us in it. This is a spiritual gym. You need a workout. Can't just sit there and be a couch potato. So here's a suggestion. Ready? If you're not experiencing pain, if you're not experiencing sickness or suffering in your life, here's what you can do. Take up your cross and suffer for the kingdom of God. Take up your cross. It's, the, it's pre-designed by God. He wants to add some stress to your life because he wants you to be better. People say, well, it's all about diet, you know, and I know people that are, are vegans and vegetarians. They eat only organic food. People that exercise all the time, they're still going to die. Because it only works if you love God and you live according to his purpose. Because stress is going to kill you no matter what your diet is. I know people who were more athletic. They ate better than me. They worked out more. I was jealous. But things don't work out that way unless you're walking with God and living according to his purpose because stress can kill. But if you're living according to God's purpose, you will live the fullness of days that God has designed for you. Amen? Not one day more. Not one day more, but to the fullness that God has designed. I believe that you can do a lot to shorten your life. But you can't do anything to lengthen it because God has set the days. So we have to count the days. We have to count the hours and do the will of God. But loving God alone is not going to do it. You must love God and live according to his purpose. Then stress will make you stronger and you can experience the abundant life that Jesus promised. Now, I'm going to close with this. Seven ideas that will help you live that abundant life and cope with stress differently. That you will get the benefits of the, the system that God designed us to be and, and the stress that surrounds us for us to get the maximum benefits and reach that potential. Here are seven ideas. Number one, learn about spiritual warfare and prayer and fasting. Learn about spiritual warfare and prayer and fasting. These are powerful weapons that ha God has given us to overcome. Number two, take up your cross each day and do the will of God. Put your will aside. Let God sit on the throne of your life and it's gonna cost you. You have to take up your cross. Number three, don't be satisfied with just being saved, but push into the kingdom of God. Push in to the kingdom of God. It says that the kingdom of God makes itself violent and only the violent will take it by force. There's a forceful attitude that we must live with to move forward into the purpose of God, not in a passive way. Well, they haven't asked me to volunteer for anything in church. No, get up every morning and hound your pastor until they tell you what to do in church and how you can volunteer and what, how you can serve. Hound them. So that I had one friend of mine, he hounded his pastor so much about going to the mission field that one day the pastor sent him to the mission field. And I said, Pastor, why did you send that guy to the to the mission field he goes because I got tired of him asking me so I laid hands on him and sent them out you know how bad do you want to do the will of God how bad do you want to serve there has to be some desire and effort in your part now some people physically can't go some people can't do the things that they wish they could do or they did a few years ago they can't do them anymore but you can contribute 
in some way to the purposes of God. Don't just be satisfied with being a good Christian. You'll get none of the stress. If you just tithe, anybody can do that. You don't need a calculator for that. Just move the decimal point over, right? But if you're like constantly searching, how can I do more than just a tithe this month or this week? And you're kind of like, I shouldn't be doing this. This makes me uncomfortable. And you begin to stretch yourself and stress out about your finances. You're trying to figure out how much more you can give to the mission or how much more you can do for other people. You're stretching yourself. You're stressing yourself out, but in a good way. Because you're just not satisfied with being a, a normal Christian. Number four, know that his grace will always, say always, be sufficient. Because stress is good for you, God will not always remove it when you pray for it. Because your problems come with a purpose, God will not take it away even, even if you pray three times. But he will give you grace. He will tell you you're not going to die from this. As a matter of fact, this is going to make your heart stronger. You're not going to die from this problem. As a matter of fact, I'm sending more oxygen to your brain and to your organs. I'm dilating your blood vessels so your system will be stronger, but I'm not going to take the problem away. His grace is always sufficient. Number five, know that all things work together for good if you love God and are called according to his purpose. This is not a cliche. People forget that, the second half. Oh, all things are going to work together for good. No, something's come to destroy. Well, it's a silver cloud and a silver lining in every cloud. No, there's tragedies that do not end well. But if you love God, how many love God? And you want to live according to his purpose. How many want to live according to his purpose? Then you can say, all things are going to work for good whether it's from the devil or from the Lord, whether it's from my husband or from my wife. It doesn't matter where my problem comes from or who the devil uses. This is going to make me stronger, and I'm going to become an overcomer. Number six, learn how to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. People do not understand that the things of the flesh are earthly, carnal, and demonic you're on bad territory once you step out of the spirit. Don't go there. Stay in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Keep spiritual relationships. Don't put yourself in danger by putting yourself on the bonic territory. The problems you confront there are outside of God's purposes. They will kill you. They will affect you negatively. They will affect people. You know, sometimes we say, ah, I can go over there. It's not, I can handle that. And you drag somebody from your family with you, and they're the ones that get affected, not you. Stay in the spirit. Stay away from the carnal stuff. Learn how to walk in the spirit. Just learn how to say no when you get an invitation to go into the flesh. Respond in the spirit. React in the spirit, not in the flesh. And number seven, learn how to express gratitude. Every day, it releases good stuff in your body. Express. Say it with me, express. express. You have to use your vocal cords. Express gratitude toward God every day. Find stuff in your life to be thankful to God for. And if you can, just thank God for being God. Thank Him for creating you. Thank Him for creating the universe. Express gratitude to God and express gratitude that to people that God has put in your life. Say express. That means tell them. Everybody nods their heads, but on the way home, the Holy Spirit, thank your husband for being your husband, and you don't say anything. No, thank him. Say, honey, I want to thank God for putting you in my life. And then I believe you will be functioning in a way where you'll get less sick, You'll be more encouraged. You'll be sleeping better at night. You will have less chronic pain. You will have less cardiovascular issues. And you'll be able to handle more stress than you ever handled in your past. Because you've understood that God designed you to handle more than you can ever imagine. And overcome.
How many know that God is good? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else is going to be added onto you. Let that be your motto. Let that be your, the way that you live your life where you're seeking God above all else. When, when a decision has to be made, it's the things of God first. When you have to go somewhere, what is God, God's purpose in that? Should I go there? Why am I going there? What is the purpose? We need to begin to reevaluate our life and change the way that we think, change our perspectives, change our philosophy of Christianity because there's too many Christians suffering and dying because their priorities are out of order and stress is killing them. God bless you. Please stand to your feet. I'm going to ask the ministry team to come forward and thank you, Dr. Molina, for this science lesson today. And you know that science and the Bible do not contradict each other. Whenever there seems to be a contradiction, it's because either the science is not true or we have a misinterpretation of the Bible. But whenever we have a true interpretation of God's word and the science is true, scripture and science always come into alignment. And we've seen an example of it today. Because the Lord made both. He made all things. And nothing that has been made was not made by him. Everything was made by him. And he holds everything together. He holds you together. He's the one who holds the molecules of your body together. He is your God. He is the source of your life and your strength. And when you love and when you thank and when you praise him and when you exercise the joy of the Lord, Health flows like a river inside of you. Do you believe it? Hold your hands out, please. I'm going to just release some dopamine <laughs> into you. In the name of Jesus, I release the blessings of God over your life. I break off every curse and every judgment and every evil word spoken against you. I speak the peace of God into your body the joy of the Lord into your life. I break off every attack against you in the name of Jesus. I speak God's blessing over you and over your marriage and over your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. I release the favor of God, the covering of heaven over your life and I speak it in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.